we're just perfect. Um, so we're just going to start uh, with a couple logistics. So next slide. Awesome. So um, hopefully everyone's pretty familiar with Zoom by now. It seems like we've been operating in this world for a while, but um, it looks like it's a little bit of a smaller group. So we may also ask people to, you know, come off mute and chat, but um, you have the option of coming off mute, stopping video. Uh, we love to see your beautiful faces. It helps for training to just not train to a bunch of black boxes. <laughs> so um, would encourage you to come off camera. Um, you can see the other participants on the call um, and chat. There's a chat box. We will uh, encourage you to utilize chat in some of these sessions. Um, again, it looks like it's a smaller group. So we also encourage you to kind of contribute, come off mute, um, feel free to ask questions. Um, we're big fans of the reaction emojis. So we may ask you to heart or thumbs up if you're um, familiar with things. So you can see the little reaction button in your, your um, bottom toolkit. Uh, so, but definitely you can also raise your hand there. So if there's a particular question as we're going through, feel free to interrupt and raise your hand to ask questions. Um, again, it is a little bit smaller of a group. So we want this to be as interactive as possible, especially um, given that motivational interviewing is best learned by, by practicing it. So uh, next slide. So just a little bit of an introduction. Um, I will let my colleague who's going to be co-facilitating with me introduce herself in a minute too, but we are both from the Technical Assistance Collaborative and we're a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to helping the nation's human services, healthcare, housing, homelessness, and affordable housing systems really implement policies and practices that empower people to live healthy and independent lives in the communities we choose that they choose. So next slide, I'll do a quick introduction to myself and let Teresa also introduce herself. But um, I am a licensed clinical social worker with over 15 years of experience kind of in the overlap between the behavioral health and housing world. Um, and so uh, prior to coming to TAC, I was overseeing um, the crisis response system in Washington, DC. Um, but prior to that, oversaw street outreach. And the majority of my experience is around street outreach and um, homeless systems and just kind of better coordination between the behavioral health and the homeless system. So I'm really excited to be here with you. And I will let Teresa introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. I'm also really excited to be here and, and interacting with all of you. My name is Teresa Young. I'm also a social worker by trade. Um, and I have 14 going on 15 years of experience in human services. And a lot of that included um, substance use and homelessness services. My previous role, I oversaw some outreach, some shelters, some low threshold engagement programs. Um, and before that, worked on the mass cast area in Boston um, in a lot of those encampments doing access to addiction treatment. So I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So next slide, we would love to know more about who's in the room with us and kind of what you're interested in learning. So um, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, um, name, pronouns, organization, um, and we're particularly interested in if there's one particular thing that you were hoping to learn today. Um, we are nothing if not interactive trainers, so we definitely try to pivot and incorporate, and we want this to be as helpful and useful for you as possible. So um, if you can, we'll give it a minute and let people introduce themselves in the chat. We're very excited to have everyone here. Um, as people are introducing themselves, definitely if there are particular questions or things you want covered, um, feel free to include that in the chat box. Um, so next slide. So I think the other thing that we wanted to get a feel for is just how comfortable people are or how familiar people are with motivational interviewing as a concept. So um, wanted to do a quick poll um, and just get a, a feeling for if you have 
no familiarity, if you've heard of motivational interviewing, if you're familiar with it and utilizing motivational interviewing skills, or if you kind of have expert knowledge in motivational interviewing. So it'll definitely help us kind of walk through some of the um, techniques and, and uh, cater some of our examples today. We're gonna give it a minute as people complete the slot or complete the poll. Cause I know sometimes it's hard to write in chat and complete a poll. <laughs> We're asking a lot of things of you right now. So we'll give it a second. All right. So I think you guys should be able to see it. Um, it looks like the majority have heard of motivational interviewing, about 38%, um, or are familiar and currently util utilizing motivational interviewing. So we have a little bit of a tie, 38% and 38%, um, with a couple people who are not familiar at all. Maybe this is the first um, time they're they're um, hearing about it. So we'll definitely use examples and those who are familiar with it, feel free to kind of come off mute and talk about examples or situations that you've encountered. Um, again, we want this to be helpful for everyone. So next slide. So just a high level overview of what we're going to be talking about in the next two hours. So um, our agenda is really to talk about a trauma-informed approach to motivational interviewing. Um, as we'll talk about kind of the stages of change and, and spirit of motivational interviewing, it's really kind of our approach to the work that's so important and our, we tend to be grounded in really trauma-informed approaches and trauma-informed work. And obviously, you know, we're working with a population that has had multiple traumas that, you know, often homelessness is experiencing homelessness itself can be traumatic. And so want to just do some level setting and groundwork around how to have a trauma-informed approach to motivational interviewing. Um, and we'll spend some time talking about building off of that, really the stages of change in the spirit of motivational interviewing, which is very similar to some of the principles of trauma-informed care and trauma-informed approaches. Um, and we'll spend a fair amount of the time today really talking about those core skills for motivational interviewing and give an example, um, let you have an example of working through those core skills through um, a demonstrated role play and uh, letting each of you do role play on your own. And then we'll spend some time talking about the four processes and then techniques to elicit specific change talks. So techniques to recognize when people are engaging in change talk and then how do you um, draw that talk out to move people forward together. Um, and then we'll end with a role play and case discussion um, and, and leave some time for questions and answers as well. So um, before we get started, next slide. Um, we just wanted to hear from you all and feel free to drop your answers on the chat. Um, when you hear the term motivational interviewing, what things come to mind for you? Rapport building, open-ended questions, change. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about open-ended questions today. Influence to have positive behavior, 100%. And continue to drop kind of those ideas in the chat. Encouragement, yeah, 100%. Change can be scary. Sometimes you just need encouragement and you need somebody that has faith to help you have faith that you're gonna you're gonna make that change, right? So continue to drop kind of things in the chat that you think about when you think about motivational interviewing, because these are gonna be topics that we're talking about throughout this training and topics that we're gonna circle back to. I see building trust again, rapport, rapport building, exploring change, letting the client lead 100%. We're gonna talk a lot about um, it's really motivational interviewing is about empowerment and particularly from a trauma informed lens, you want that person to have autonomy in the process because often they 
don't have choices or they haven't had choices in the past. So that's very important. And encouragement came up again, 100%. I think all of these are things that kind of bubble up when you think about motivational interviewing. So um, I, with that, I think we're gonna spend a little bit time just level setting and laying the foundation. So next slide, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Teresa to talk about a trauma-informed approach for motivational interviewing. Thank you, Jordan. So like Jordan mentioned, you know, motivational in interviewing and a trauma-informed approach kind of go hand in hand. Um, we always want to have trauma at the forefront of our mind when we're working with folks, especially folks that are unsheltered or living encampments. You know, we've already kind of hit on the fact that it's it's going to be really unlikely that those folks don't have any experience with trauma. In fact, they probably have quite a bit of an experience with trauma um, just from the experiences they face every day in that situation. Next slide. So let's start with why people do or do not change. Um, I'm gonna describe this in case the text is too small for anyone. So we have our friend in his doctor's office. The doctor's kind of lecturing him about all of the reasons he needs to change his behavior to promote his health. And when he gets home, he's talking to maybe his friend or his partner. And they said, what did the doctor say? And he said, I don't know, I stopped listening. And what that really is driving at is you're not gonna be shamed into change and the folks that we work with are not gonna be shamed into change. And what motivational interviewing really is about is partnering with people to empower them to make change and understanding their reasons and kind of letting them you know, walk alongside you while we're identifying things that you know, they're not serving the people we work with anymore, things that they are thinking about changing and talking through how we might go about that, but really letting them lead and really um, keeping at the forefront of our mind that we're, we're going with their reasons and their motivation, not these external things. You know, sometimes external things can play a, a role, but to sustain change and have that, you know, environment where change happens, we want kind of like a non-judgmental relationship with that person. And we want to understand why they want to do this and help guide them in that way. Um, next slide. And this quote kind of just summarizes that, right? People are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they have themselves discovered than by those which have come into the minds of others. Um, and so I always encourage folks to kind of connect with the experiences of the people that we work with and think like, what are some reasons I do or do not change? So if I was starting an exercise program or if I wanted to cut back on something like smoking or eating fast food, what are some reasons that I do that? And if you want to, you can drop some in the chat. You can say like, what are things that have motivated me to change? And maybe what were some things that didn't motivate me to change? Like, have you ever had an experience where, um, someone was lecturing you on why you should change. And did you feel like that was effective? I know for me personally, um, that's not something that would probably motivate me, but you know, really connecting like with my values and understanding my values, that's what might move change forward. And that's kind of what we're talking about with MI. We wanna build relationships with people. We wanna understand where they're coming from and we want to help them build upon their values to find kind of reasons to change. And so Jordan just dropped the question in the chat. What has motivated you to change in the past and what has not been helpful? If you want to add that, we can you know, take a look at some of your thoughts. You move to the next slide. So what is motivational? Oh, can you go back? Thanks. What is motivational interviewing? Um, so we mentioned it's collaborative, goal-oriented style of communication with particular attention to the language of change. So when you're hearing folks talk about change, kind of zeroing in on that, it's designed to strengthen personal motivation, and again, personal motivation, not our or others' motivation, for and commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change with an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. 
Um, and I kind of can't um, emphasize the acceptance and compassion piece enough because that's how we create kind of like the stage for change, right? We, you know, we, we create a space in a relationship where people feel like they can be honest about what's going on with them and they feel like they're not going to be judged, but that you're just meeting them where they are and you're really like taking this walk with them to um, kind of make things that they believe will improve their lives happen. Next slide. And to do that, we need to understand the role of behavior. Um, and so remembering that our role in the relationship is not to judge behavior, but to really try to understand that and understand that behavior serves a purpose. And often when we see behavior, there's so much that is beneath that. Um, and so really trying to get at the heart of that, if you look at the image, um, you know, we kind of, you'll see what we mean. So like we need to dig deeper. So an example that probably comes up frequently if you're working and doing outreach is maybe you are coming across someone that seems like really, really reluctant to engage. Um, and you might be leaning towards thinking like, well, I think they're just not interested or they don't want to do this. But if we dug a little deeper and we really tried to understand maybe thinking of that person as a whole person, so what got them to this place where they feel safer putting up a wall or you know not really being free with their trust rather than you know initially engaging. So it could be that that person has not had good interactions with service providers in the past where they felt judged. Um, maybe they've had kind of really a tough go of it in their lives due to many one of the isms that we all encounter so maybe racism classism sexism whatever it might be that has you know created experiences for them in their life where you know trust doesn't actually feel so safe because maybe they've given it that trust and they've been burned i think as service providers in general though i think we're making a lot of progress in this area historically we've kind of left the voices out of people who receive the services right we haven't always factored them into that design um and so unfortunately the impact is is that services might not have been effective for them they might not have been helpful for them and in the worst case scenario they could have been harmful to them so we really um trying to understand why that person might not want to engage. And always that there's needs that are being unmet when we're talking about behavior. So uh, maybe if someone is really angry and grumpy with you, their basic needs aren't being met. Maybe if someone is really unable to make appointments and, and you know, we're categorizing them as like unmotivated, well, maybe that's not the case. Maybe that they have so many competing survival needs just getting their basic needs like food, shelter, water met during the day if they're living outside, that it's really difficult to focus on anything else. So there's always more to the behavior than is on the surface. And of course, trauma plays a role, right? Um, all of these isms and all of these experiences can be traumatic. And, you know, we, I always say about trauma, it's a normal reaction to an abnormal experience, right? So living outside unsheltered is terrible. And so the things that folks do that we might not see as helpful or like serving them, they do serve a purpose. They do serve a purpose. So let's, um, we can move on to the next slide. And of course, there's also the fact that change is hard and change is scary and change is really difficult. And that's not, just for folks that are living unsheltered or folks that we're working with, change is hard for everyone. I think there's like a tiny, there's some research that there's like a tiny, tiny subset of the population that can just pick up a new habit and run with it. But for most of us, the vast majority of us, it's gonna be tough and we're gonna experience setbacks. So, um, and there's a lot of, challenges when it comes to letting go of behavior because every behavior, though it doesn't serve us, 
maybe, like maybe eating junk food doesn't serve us, it doesn't serve our health, it serves a purpose because it maybe it is comforting, maybe it is something that we're just used to, it's part of our habits. So um, though it might not serve our health reasons, it serves a purpose. And so there's always pros and cons when you're talking about behavior change. Um, and again, as our, our role as the provider, it's not our role to judge behavior, it's to understand it and work with people when they identify something that they want to change and work towards their goals with them. And sometimes um, a note on kind of like how we bring ourselves and show up in the work, we all come with backgrounds, we all come with beliefs, and there may be things that our clients are doing that maybe we have some biases about or we have some thoughts about and we really need to check that at the door in order to be effective, right? We want, again, non-judgment is like central to this approach. Um, so making sure we're checking in with ourselves, we're leaving our agendas at the door, we're really taking the other person's lead and that we're checking our own biases, whether that's you know something you're doing internally or something that you do in supervision, um, making sure that we truly can create that non-judgmental space where someone feels safe to tell us what's really going on and what they're struggling with. Next slide. So I wanted to bring some real life example. You know, as I mentioned, I did work in encampments. I did work with unsheltered folks. And this is something that um, these are two scenarios that I think have come up several times. And it may be scenarios that you all are also familiar with um, and have seen several times. And it, and it gets at like, there are reasons that people continue something that might not be super helpful for them, right? So when we talk about someone who's maybe not engaging, let's think about this case example, Rich. So Rich is not engaging in housing search. Living outside is making his medical conditions more difficult to treat, right? So it's having some impact on his life. Um, Rich had housing in the past, he was very lonely and isolated. His mental health worsened and he eventually lost his apartment. He hates being alone and without support, he can experience more paranoia. So we kind of want to like think about that behavior and really understand the whole picture. Okay. So Rich, of course, probably wants to stop living outside and he's recognizing that his um, health conditions are being worsened by living outside. However, he has valid reasons for being wary about going into housing again. He had a painful experience in the past. He experienced isolation. I think sometimes we take for granted the transition to living amongst a lot of people to living yourself can be really tough without support. And so, you know, really trying to understand folks and meet them where they are and understand the full picture of their experience. Um, another example that I've come across many, many times, and I imagine you have as well, um, Jennifer is a trans woman. She uses stimulants to stay up all night and protect herself in her campsite. She has been assaulted and robbed in the past. The stimulant use and lack of sleep have led to several hospitalizations and interactions with law enforcement. She still feels safer this way. So, you know, there's consequences in her life to the things that she's doing. So not sleeping and, you know, eventually that leading into some negative consequences. However, this is how she feels she's protecting herself. So again, taking the real deep dive into why it's so difficult for folks to make changes and the things that they might be holding on to that are reasonable and understandable that um, prevent them from taking steps and moving forward. Next slide. So that moves us into the stages of change. So this is one slide, but there's a ton of information on it. Um, and we'll go through each stage and kind of like the overall picture of how change does and doesn't happen. Um, and we can use an example if you'd like. Um, so let's start with pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's where someone might be engaging in in some drug use or substance use, but they at this point kind of like the benefits of the behavior, maybe that's 
and re remembering like all behavior has a benefit, right? Maybe the relaxation that comes from drinking at the end of the day, um, maybe that outweighs kind of the cost, which might be um, your health. It might be that when you drink, the people around you aren't so happy with your behavior, but right now they're really not thinking about changing at all whatsoever. So pre-contemplation, that you're not even considering this an issue yet. Maybe people in life around you are considering it an issue, but you're pretty okay with how things are. Um, so maybe you're having conversations with that person and just exploring what their drinking look like looks like. So like, just tell me about when you drink and you're refraining from judgment, you're refraining from really pushing the issue, but you're engaging with that person and you're just trying to understand the context of that behavior. So maybe some time passes and this person is starting to recognize a little bit more the role that alcohol is having in some of their troubles. Um, maybe they are noticing that they really aren't feeling well. Maybe they um, value their friendships and they're kind of being affected and they're understanding that it's having a negative impact on that. So that might move them into contemplation. And that's where someone is, is thinking about making a change. And so maybe you're seeing them and they're starting to say like, you know, I kind of wish I could cut back on my drinking or um, I was drinking last night and it, and I really, it caused me some trouble with my, my partner. Um, so you're starting to kind of hear that person talking about reasons they might want to change and though they're connected to their values. Um, so they're thinking about why they want to change and maybe you're continuing to work with that. And I will just kind of as an aside say that this isn't going to be something that happens in one conversation, right? This is going to be something that happens in many, many conversations over time. Um, so if that person is starting to talk about the reasons they might want to change. Maybe you're you're recognizing that and you're having conversations with them about what that might look like if they were to make a change and what would the benefit be, what would the drawbacks be. And our hope is that per then that person moves into determination saying like they really feel ready to change and they are ready to maybe start planning some steps and you're partnering with them to engage in like a, a, a plan, I guess, to um, to take some actions to kind of reduce the negative impacts of their drinking. So um, that might look like um, cutting down on the number of drinks you have per day or um, timing space between drinks. and. Um, it also might look like total abstinence, but I, I always put in multiple options because um, I think sometimes we get, as providers, we really get caught up in this idea that like abstinence is the ultimate goal and that's us agenda setting. So we want to make sure that we are um, following their lead and, and there is like true evidence for risk reduction in drinking. And so if someone says, um, no, I'm not ready to stop, but I want to just drink less and then and see if that, you know, kind of helps me um, improve my quality of life. Then, you know, we're partnering with them and we're empowering them to make that choice about their own health. And we're working through with them how they might do that. So hopefully, you know, if they're feeling ready, if they're feeling motivated, if we've kind of like had our conversations, done our work, then they might feel ready to take some action steps. And so the action phase is changed as they are taking concrete steps. So maybe they say, all right, this weekend, I'm only going to buy X number of nips per day and that's it. Um, and so that's a step, there's a concrete step that they're making towards change. Hopefully, if those action steps go well and they kind of start to see the benefits and the impacts to the changes that they're making, we move to maintenance. And maintenance is just continuing to support the change that they've made. Um, however, I would say that that's not really how it, it's going to go, and that's not usually how it looks. Um, so 
as you can see, if you look at the, the little arrow, you can exit and enter at any stage. So you might come across someone who's like already ready to take action, or you might come across someone who kind of vacillates between not thinking it's a problem to thinking it's a problem and back to not thinking it's a problem. So it's not linear. And that's, um, that's something I'm, I think you'll find frequently. And I think the other piece we really need to talk about is recurrence. Um, and we know for folks that use substances that there is a, you know, a high rate of recurrence that as people make changes, they, you know, they will have setbacks, just like any of us as we try to make changes will have setbacks. So like you might go to the gym for three weeks and then you don't go for a week. And, you know, unfortunately, when we're talking about substance use, if that's what we're talking about, we tend to kind of catastrophize the setbacks. And um, I like to think of our role as more like, like hope dealers. So if someone has a setback, I think it's really, really important that we normalize that and that we don't catastrophize. We don't like automatically view them as back at square one because we believe in people's potential and they very well may have a setback at the maintenance phase and want to go right back to action, or they may go back to pre-contemplation. I think the important part is that you remember kind of where you sit as a provider is to partner with them wherever they're at without judgment, normalize that experience, and then just keep walking alongside them and, and having the conversations that help move them forward towards their stated goals, whatever that might be. Um, so I think I threw a lot at you at that. So I don't know if we want to, if anyone has questions right now, if we want to take some of those or we could move on. I just want to elevate. I think there's a lot, it was a lot of information. Um, and it sounds like there's a fair amount that are familiar with motivational interviewing, but I just want to elevate, I think the level setting around trauma. So I just wanted to elevate some of the things that are in the chat. Um, so Patricia had a client perhaps has community while unhoused, and it's very difficult for some of our clients to be alone with their minds in an apartment without supportive. So thinking of like the, the trauma of change where you're going to live on your own. And I, um, and then Mary also elevated that many conversations building trust and showing actions by what you are also doing so you can they can plan they can follow with their plan lots of encouragement lots of positive acknowledgement with steps they can they take even if they are small um it may be big to them actions on both sides to move forward what i think is really that spirit of am i and that trauma-informed approach so um just wanted to elevate some of the comments in the chat but um Feel, feel free if anybody has reactions or thoughts, definitely um, throw them in the chat or feel free to come off mute. We are a small group. Okay, um, if we don't have any questions at this point, I think we can um, move forward to the next slide where I will pass it off to Jordan to talk about the spirit of motivational interviewing. Awesome, thanks so much. So I think the spirit of motivational interviewing is very tied to that trauma-informed approach and to some of the comments that were coming through in the chat. Um, can you guys give me a reaction, a thumbs up if you're familiar with the spirit of motivational interviewing? And while you guys are doing that, let's go to the next slide. Awesome. So it's definitely seeing some thumbs up coming through. Um, so when thinking about, uh, and a lot of this was elevated in the comments that were coming through, when thinking about um, your role in motivational interviewing, we think about it being a dance. It's really... Um, you thumbs up awesome <laughs> yeah i know not everybody can find the reaction so feel free to throw it in the chat too but, so it seems like there is some some general understanding so we won't spend too too much time on this but do a, a high level overview um 
your your role is really a dance. You can't, uh, you don't have to make change happen, which obviously takes pressure off, right? Because you can't make people change. You know, a lot of the, the reasons we've talked about, people are going to change um, in their own time when they're comfortable and when they feel psychologically safe to do so, which is really some of those principles that we're going to talk about with the spirit of motivational interviewing is creating psychological safety for people. Um, but it kind of takes the pressure off you, you don't have to come up with the answers. You don't have to make them change, you know, and, and you're not the best person to come up with those answers because we know, you know, individuals are experts in their own lives. Um, the individuals closest to the, the challenge or the problems are those that have the best solutions, right? Um, so really motivational interviewing is a dance to give people that safety and help them explore feelings, um, in really a way that maybe they haven't had the opportunity in the past. Um, you know, and I put this in the chat, people change when they feel psychologically safe to do so. Um, and, you know, Teresa talked about trauma and maybe there's past experiences with providers, maybe pr providers have over promised and under delivered. And so, you know, you go out to engage them and you hear all kinds of explicit <laughs> things because, um, you know, you don't, they're like, I don't want anything to do with you. My past learning experience, which is tied to trauma, has told me absolutely not. Um, so you don't, it, the beauty of motivational interviewing and why often it's utilized is you don't have to be clever or complex. Somebody just put in the, the chat uh, that they liked the be interested, interested and curious. That's really what it's about. It's a genuine curiosity of learning more about the person, learning more about their experience, because, um, you know, somebody put empathy earlier when we talked about motivational interviewing. It's really about empathizing with that individual and seeing the world from their perspective and really trying to understand, you know, what's going on and what are the things they're considering to change and what are the things that are keeping them kind of in the same place. Um, and really, it's not a wrestle. Um, it's a dance, but often working with individuals, sometimes it can feel like wrestling. And I think when that happens, it's really about stopping, taking a step back and evaluating like, okay, am I pushing my own agenda? Am I too invested? Are system pressures impacting my interaction with this person? You know, particularly in encampments, it's a hot button topic. And so, you know, I know in DC, we would get calls from the mayor's office. You gotta go out there, you gotta, you know, we don't move people, but sometimes our interactions might be impacted by external pressures. And so being able to take that step back and say, this doesn't feel like a dance anymore. It feels like we're kind of wrestling each other. So being able to kind of step back, think about it and figure out a better approach moving forward is part of the dance. Um, so next slide. So in thinking about that, we're gonna talk about the spirit of motivational interviewing. And it sounds like there's a couple thumbs up in the chat of people who are familiar with it, but I'm gonna kind of use the analogy of gardening. So the spirit of motivational interviewing is really laying that groundwork um, for gardening. So, um, and as people threw in the chat earlier, it's really about relationship building. It's about the relationship you have with individuals. And that is the spirit of motivational interviewing. So I love that the acronym is PACE. Um, and the reason that I love that is I get this visual image of people walking alongside or running alongside with each other and they're doing it at the same pace, you know, someone's not way ahead, someone's not way behind, they're doing it together at the same cadence. And so how do we get that pace? Um, through partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation. And so partnership is really about collaboration. Um, so how uh, are we providing power back to this person while walking alongside with them? You think about trauma and trauma-informed approaches. Individuals often feel powerless as a result of trauma. And so how are we taking intentional steps to return power to that person? They're the expert in their lives. They should be driving the ship. Um, but often in, in therapeutic and working relationships, they may not feel that way. And, you know, Teresa talked a little bit about that, but it's really about part of the spirit of motivational interviewing is demonstrating that genuine respect um, and it's partnership because there's both a role for the case manager, the outreach worker and the individual. Um, and so that's why it's a dance. You're doing it together. Um, 
And acceptance is really about non-judgmental, unconditional, positive regard. So nothing that this person can say or do actually changes their inherent worth. And I feel like particularly with, you know, unsheltered or people staying in shelters, there's their worth is questioned all the time. Um, I, I think about, you know, doing outreach where we would engage an individual and every day we'd be like, so good to see you. And he's like, it's nice to be seen. So it's really about seeing people um, and and um, engaging without judgment, engaging with um, empathy and affirmation. Um, and I think compassion is also, you know, about seeing people, how nice to feel seen and validated. Um, but actively considering, you know, what's, what is in their best interest um, and how am I supporting moving forward with this process in their, in their best interest. Um, and it's a genuine value for the well-being of that person. Um, you know, I'm a social worker by trade, so it's always, you know, you, the first thing I remember from social work school is people know when you're being genuine, and it's true. You know, compassion is that genuine interest in their and their well-being, and making sure that that's kind of the guiding factor in moving forward. Um, and you think about evocation. So how um, how am I helping someone draw out what they need to express, particularly if there's past trauma? You think about. Um, Processing trauma is about being able to express what happened and then make sense of it when you do kind of trauma therapy. So really it's it's helping people get their voice back, right? Um, so evoking that individual to find their own motivation, their own resources, um, and really make the, the change that's best for them. So it's invoking um, their own ability um, to move forward in a positive direction. Um, and so similar to kind of what Teresa talked about with um, trauma-informed approach, PACE is very similar. It's the approach to which the work is, is really laying that soil. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the skills, which are really those tools when you're gardening. How do you, how do you use those tools? So next slide. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the core skills and techniques for motivational interviewing um, and really give you a chance to kind of utilize some of these core techniques. Um, so uh, because motivational interviewing is all about acronyms, we have some more acronyms for you. So next slide, we're going to talk about ORS. Um, and so uh, we start with kind of open-ended questions. Um, you think about open-ended questions is really that visual of how do you open the conversation? Um, and it, the goal is to ask people in a way that elicits conversations and allows them to reflect and um, talk about their experience from their perspective. Um, you know, we, we the opposite of that is closed-ended questions where you, yes, no, I don't wanna, I think about engaging a teenager sometimes and it's nope, yep, okay, thanks. Um, so that's kind of not what we want to happen, right? When we're engaging individuals um, and trying to um, just understand their perspective, we want them to feel comfortable and safe talking. And so it's really, you think about how do we do that? Um, the how, why, tell me more, what do you think, kind of all of the the how, why, what, when questions that help elicit some of those, those uh, conversations. And so, you know, what things do you think keep you from reaching this goal? Or tell me more about X, Y, and Z. And it really allows the person um, not only does it continue the rapport building process, which everybody has has said in chat is so important to this process, but it also allows the person to um, clarify and, and just you to get an understanding of their own world and their past experiences. Um, and I think, you know, given that we know um, there's a lot of trauma and past experience, it really lets that person have autonomy to disclose what they want to disclose at what time. And so kind of open-ended questions are another tool just to let, to make sure that that person's kind of the one in the driver's seat. And so the next uh, skill we're gonna talk about are affirmations. And affirmations are really recognizing strengths. Um, you know, what are we looking for 
are, what are we looking for that's strong rather than what are we looking for that's wrong? Um, and often in service oriented or, you know, more often in behavioral health, but it's really looking at like, okay, where are the deficits? Where are, you know, let's, where are the needs? Um, but this is really about, let's identify what's strong rather than what's wrong. And so it's, um, Recognizing strengths, it's often elevating strengths that maybe that person isn't aware of or hasn't thought about. You know, I've engaged so many people who maybe were doing an intake assessment and I asked about strengths and they're like, I don't know. And so it's in the moment identifying, you know, oh, I, I see these are your strengths. I see you're really commit, committed to this. I, you know, you continue to persist even though you've had setbacks. It's highlighting those strengths um, in a way that helps them see them, but also helps build confidence that they're, you're right, I can do this. I have done similar in the past. Um, and so just building confidence and efficacy. Um, the other thing we're gonna spend some time talking about are reflections. And so you think of reflections like a mirror, just reflecting you know, back. And I think often it's reflecting back what the individual is saying but also reflecting back sometimes what they're not saying. Um, you know, I hear you saying this, but I'm also observing this. Can you tell me more about what's going on there? Um, but I think this is an important part to allow, to make sure that you're all on the same page, right? I'm hearing you say this, is that what you're trying to tell me? No, actually I th I'm saying this, but you almost have it. So, it, you know, reflections allow you to make sure that you're on the same page. Um, it provides, uh, an opportunity for the person to clarify any misinterpretations, but also um, ensures that you're on the same page, that you have an understanding. I think the other purpose and, and um, benefit of reflections is it it helps the person feel heard, validated, and understood. And how lovely is it to feel heard and seen. And I go back to that individual saying, it's great to be seen, you know, reflecting their experience back to them as I hear you, I'm here with you, I'm walking alongside you. Um, and I think that's a completely validating experience for people who often feel unvalidated in the broader system in the broader world. And so the last thing we'll talk about is summaries. And so summaries are very similar to reflections, but kind of on a broader spectrum, they encapsulate more of the conversation. So it's uh, effectively engaging in reflective listening. Um, often it's used to close the conversation or transition to a different part of the conversation. Um, so it's really paraphrasing or pulling out key points. You know, um, I had an individual who loved to talk and they would talk for about 30 minutes and then I'd be like, I'm gonna summarize what we just talked about. And so it's kind of pulling out those key points. I heard you say that you are really interested in housing, but you, you know, you also aren't aren't gonna stop using until you're in housing. And right now, this is how you cope and all your friends are doing it and you understand the, you know, been a, the detriments to your health, but right now it's how you are coping and that's, you know, how you're surviving right now. And so did I get that right? Do you wanna add anything else to this? It's really summarizing the conversation. So it ensures that again, everyone's on the same page but it also moves forward to like, what's our plan moving forward? We talked about this today. You said X, Y, and Z. It's kind of, I committed to doing this, you committed to doing that. Um, and so I think it's a way to make sure everybody's on the page, same page, but also segue into a different uh, part of the conversation. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time digging into some of these skills. Um, so next slide, we'll talk a little bit about open-ended questions. Um, so thinking of open-ended questions, uh, um, again, the uh, how, what, why, thinking of those questions, um, these are all closed-ended questions, you know, are you feeling better today? Yes, no. Um, so wanted to spend some time practicing turning these into open-ended questions. And because we're a smaller group, if anybody's brave, feel free to come off mute, but how might you translate, are you feeling better today into a more open-ended question that allows somebody to express themselves or elaborate? How are you feeling today? Yep, that is a quick and easy fix, isn't it? You just changed one word. <laughs> or how are you feeling today? It lets them say what they wanna say and take the lead in the conversation. 
How about how many times have you used in the last month? Is there a more open-ended and maybe less judgmental way to say that? How are you managing your drug use? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Annie, for coming off mute. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so how are you managing your drug use? That allow is open-ended. They can't say yes or no to it. What about, do you want to apply for jobs today? How might you use that to further the conversation? Feel free to jump in the chat or come off mute like our brave. <laughs> what jobs would you like to apply for today? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about have you cut down on your drinking? How might you ask that in an open ended way that would engage in conversation? Michelle says, are you interested in working? So you might want to say like what types of jobs are you interested in working? Um, you know, they could say yes or no to are you interested? No, I'm not interested. Um, but then you could follow up with that and say, you know, oh, well, what would you like to do today? How is cutting back going? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Any other thoughts for have you cut down on your drinking and how you might change it into an open-ended question to elicit more conversation? All right. So next slide, feel free to keep dropping in the chat. How many times did you find yourself having a drink recently? Absolutely. All right. So we're going to spend some time on affirmations. Um, and I think affirmations sometimes, so they're statements of appreciation for a person, for that person and their strengths. Um, I think often people uh, sometimes equate affirmations with, you know, oh, I'm so proud of you. And that's not necessarily what it is because you know, the other side of proud is disappointed. Um, and so it's really highlighting a person's strengths in a way that's genuine and clear. Um, and it's, you again, used to develop rapport and support building their confidence. And so um, in similar fashion, uh, feel free to come off mute or drop it in the chat. But say you're working with a mother who uh, is involved with child protective services after a DUI um, and she fears losing her children. What are some affirmations that you um, might be able to say? Um, so she's coming to work with her case manager regularly. Um, and so you could say you like, clearly she's committed to this. So you are someone who cares very deeply for your children and are, are willing to fight to keep them. You know, you're coming in regularly to meet with us because you're committed to what you need to do to resolve this situation. Um, you know, highlighting, uh, the skills and what's happening. You've worked so hard to be a good mother and, and you're worried this mistake will change things. So kind of that affirmation of you're a really good mother and you're working hard, but also reflecting empathy, reflecting empathy. You're worried that this mistake may change things for you. Um, you know, and again, you coming in shows your commitment to this task. So um, even in basic interactions with individuals, there's always strengths and um, affirmations that you can highlight. And it really helps not only to continue to develop rapport with this person, but also um, build confidence that they can move forward. Did you have something, Teresa? No, I didn't have any. I didn't have anything. Sorry, I thought you, I saw you came off mute. Sometimes giving people a title, like saying you are proactive, the yeah. fact that you came in here today, and then sometimes you find them mirroring that same word back to you and they start using the word proactive in their vocabulary which um 
Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So when people start quoting you, it's just, it's amazing. They actually heard from these Yeah. I think no, I'm oh, sorry. It's a really good point. I think Jordan, you touched on it before is that some it's strength that some people might not even see in themselves at that point. And so you're pointing out strength and then, you know, kind of, as you said, Annie, they're internalizing that. And there's like saying like, yeah, this is something that I'm doing. That's a strength that I have. Yeah. And I really love the like framing the language so that people then absorb that, that language and start, you know, this, this is why we use person-centered language. This is why we're very conscious of the, the words because people mirror back that. And so they're like, you know what, I am proactive. This is great. And then they start to see other areas that they're being proactive. Um, I see Jennifer put in the chat, you've been taking positive steps in the right direction, which can only benefit you and your family. A hundred percent, I think, you know, um, we have a, any other thoughts on affirmation? We're actually going to practice in a minute with another scenario. I think these are all really good points. And I have a question. Yeah. Could um, an affirmation also be, can you frame it or form it like as a form of gratitude, like telling the mother, thank you for coming in? Or does it have to be specific, like your behavior? Or it's like, you know, thank you for coming in. Um, I know it takes a lot. Or my question, I guess, is, is it, does it have to be a specifically highlighting the behavior or can it be a form of um, acknowledging that she's really making an effort? That's my question. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I think you can definitely acknowledge effort. Um, I think the way that we frame affirmations is really important because we want to make sure it's about the person, right? And so sometimes if, um, you know, I've heard, I've said in the past, like, oh, I really appreciate you coming in to see me today. Um, but that's more about me, right? Whereas what you said is, you know, you, you're really committed to this, you're showing commitment. And I think um, it's, it's about that person. So I think it's not just about behaviors, but it's also, you know, it can be about actions, it can be about, but I think it's important the way you frame it. So like making sure that affirmation is about them. Um, and I use the example of, I really appreciate because, you know, I've said it in the past. I'm like, no, no, no it's not about me. Let me reframe that better. <laughs> um, so I think, yes, it doesn't necessarily have to be just about behaviors. Um, it's really about behaviors, strengths, the person themselves, their inherent work. Um, so there's lots of different ways that, that affirmation can happen. And Annie says you is the keyword, 100%. So next slide, and we'll I'm loving that people are coming off mute. Keep doing it. Be brave. I'm a clinician, so I can sit in silence if we have to. <laughs> um, but uh, just to practice with someone, maybe you would have engaged. This is actually someone that was well known to me. So Trudy is using heroin three times a day. She knows it isn't good for her um, and is fed up with people harassing her about it. Over time, she's come to realize that her use has moved more from a coping habit into a harmful addiction. She feels guilty about her use and tries to hide it. Some days she only uses once a day, um, but she finds herself craving it and feels everyone around her is using. At some point she will stop, but just not yet. She states that with everything else going on in her life, this is the one area she feels like she cannot change and she won't know how to handle things if she does change. So if she was, you were engaging with her, what might be some affirmation um, that you would bring to your work with Trudy? Have you ever been to clinic? What is it like for you? Yeah, so we're, Patricia's throwing out open-ended questions too. Yeah, what was clinic like for you? Tell me about your experience. What are some other things that you might say to Trudy to highlight um, her strengths or the behaviors you're seeing that are that are positive? It sounds like you're making steps toward um, having days when you don't use it all. A hundred percent. And to Teresa's point earlier, you know, it's not always about absence. That's a huge step sometimes. 
you're you're taking this really big step and not and using uh, less some days. It's a positive thing that you've recognized where you are in your substance use, a hundred percent. Build on past attendance, our participation and methadone. Yeah, so Patricia says you can explore past experiences with treatment to kind of, you know, look at maybe she's gone to treatment multiple times and then she's clearly persistent and this is this is something that she's invested in doing. Any other thoughts about kind of um, how you might highlight affirmations or attributes that are strengths for Trudy? I think the other one that comes to mind for me sometimes with individuals like this is, you know, you're someone who knows what's best for you and you're going to do things on your own time when you're ready. Because I think that in and of itself is a strength, right? People have, she's got, she's determined, she's going to do things in her own time and in her own way, which is a great strength. So moving on, we're gonna spend a little bit of time with reflections too. Um, and I'm loving that, uh, so next slide, I'm loving that people are coming off mute. Feel free to come off mute, raise your hand. If you have questions, definitely interrupt us. Um, but reflections are a very important component to motivational interviewing. And um, in the handout we gave you, there are so many different types of, of reflections. And so we probably gave you too much information, but we feel like it's just helpful to have the different ones um, because reflections are really um, important to ensure you're on the same page, to ensure that you um, have the same understanding. Um, give me two seconds. I see Mary put in, if you've done treatment before and quick, what do you remember that helped um, in a time where you can help now? Yeah, 100%. Um, so Mary's elevating that, like if people have done treatment before asking the question around, you know, what do you remember that was helpful? So tapping into past experience and past things that were helpful. So thinking about kind of reflections and reflecting back, there's a couple different um, ways to do this. Um, and we're gonna practice in a few slides or break out and do a couple uh, practice exercises. But thinking about reflections, there's simple reflections, which is very, very easy because it's repeating back essentially exactly what they said, right? Um, so repeating back with little emphasis or addition, or addition to it. So the person says, you know, I wanna start taking my medication. And you can say something like, you wanna start taking your meds very easy, just kind of parroting back or, you know, taking medication is important to you right now. Um, so just reflecting back to, un to make sure you're on the same page and you understand. Um, there's also amplified reflections. And so sometimes you're able to reflect back on what the individual has said, but in an exaggerated way, either over-exaggerated or under-exaggerated. And it's really encouraging the individual, you know, often when you say if somebody says you never do this I immediately like get on the defense and I'm like don't say never to me. <laughs> so it's kind of that mentality you encourage individuals um, by over or under exaggerating something they may say well no that's not exactly true or they may start to tap into some of their ambivalence around a situation and so you know you think about sometimes people are mandated to treatment and I had an individual that would consistently say I'm you know I'm only in treatment because of my girlfriend and like she's over exaggerating so, you know I'm, I'm just here for my girlfriend like we don't need to work on anything I'm just here because I can tell her I came I saw you let's wrap this in five and so you know part of the engagement was like the only reason you're here is because your girlfriend if she wasn't such a worry where you would never be here and he you know sometimes he'd be like yeah exactly and I was like tell me more about that and then sometimes he'd be like well no I mean it's also creating problems in x y and z and so then using those open-ended questions to kind of elicit conversations so next slide You can also do reflections where you shift focus. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and where you're shifting is just to confirm kind of the understanding of a person's uh, situation, but also diffuse any potential discord. So, 
<laughs> you know, often, particularly when I've worked in substance use treatment, they would be like, what you, how can you help me? You don't know anything about this. So like you're engaging someone, they say, what, what would you be able to know about helping me? You've never been on the streets. And so reflecting back, you're worried about how I can support you since you, I've never been in your shoes. And it's hard to imagine that I would have any, anything that would be helpful for you. So kind of reflecting back what they're saying, but also that understanding of the feeling underneath. And then reframing is really putting it in a positive frame um, or putting it a different frame. And this is often tied to affirmations, you know, and this came up when people were uh, doing affirmations for Trudy. You know, I've tried to quit drinking so many times, but I keep relapsing. And so highlighting you're persistent, even when you face setbacks, you keep going. So we're just gonna spend a couple of minutes uh, talking through some of these <clears throat> reflections. So next slide, excuse me. So how might, if somebody said to you, I don't know why I'm even here. I only use sometimes, I got arrested just because of bad timing. How might you reflect back to that person to further the conversation? And feel free to come off mute or drop it in the chat. So it sounds like you feel like you got a bad rap. Yeah. It's a great way to summarize what they said or reflect back what they said. What about I'll stop using when I'm housed? I used to hear that a lot too. How might you reflect back what they're saying there? It sounds like um, your addiction is tied in with the fact that you're living homeless in the streets right now. Yeah. 100%. I think for this one, it was tied to coping. It sounds like you feel like the only way you can cope with being unhoused is by using. Yeah, so we'll spend some time doing these in, in specific groups too. I'm going to takes one time to make life changes, what you can do to make sure it doesn't happen again and move forward. It looks like you're uncomfortable with the situation, sounds like you want to change, 100%. And that's not only saying, you know, reflecting, but then trying to push the, the person forward a little bit, like you're ready to change, let's talk about it. So next slide. So we're just gonna do a quick role play to like act out some of uh, these situations. So this is based on an individual that Teresa worked with. Um, so Chuck is a 40 year old male in drug court, which he joined voluntarily. One of the conditions of drug court is that he abstained from all mind altering substances. Charlie was a daily pot smoker and expressed that this is something he enjoys. He has struggled to uh, give up, which he has struggled to give it up completely. It helps him manage his stress and sleep. However, it has also led to jail time, time in mandatory treatment, and a lot of time and resources spent uh, trying to, quote, beat the system to pass urines. He is ambivalent about changing. Some days he is angry of, and angry and feels this condition is unjust. Others, he recognizes that it is taking a toll and considers stopping at least until drug court is complete. So Teresa is gonna be Charlie. Um, and so kind of based on this, we had talked about Charlie has been, has come once before. And so just get started. Um, Charlie, thanks so much for coming in today. I know last week you were a little uh, under enthused about uh, having to come here. So I uh, really appreciate your commitment to coming back. It really shows that you're committed to working this out. Yeah, I mean, I have to be here. It's one of my conditions of drug court um, because I couldn't stop smoking weed and I it kept, you know, despite all my best efforts, it kept showing up in, in my talk screen. So here I am. I just want this problem to go away. Yeah, so it sounds like you want the problem to go away, but you've been having trouble stopping the behavior. Can you tell me more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, 
the threat of jail hanging over my head all the time is really, really stressful. And, you know, I'm not using opiates anymore. So this is what I have left to manage my stress. So even though I know it's causing a lot of issues, like having to run around and go to GNC and get supplements to try to not have it be in my urine whenever they call me for my my talk screen, I just, I don't have other good ways to manage my stress. And, and so it's hard for me to stop. It sounds like you've made strides because you've stopped using opioids and you feel like that's a big accomplishment, but you also are struggling with stopping the, the marijuana. And it sounds like right now, that's how you're coping with some of the stresses. Exactly. Like it was huge for me to give up opiates, but you know, this is the one thing that I have left. And I know, you know, I, I know that it's kind of like six of one half dozen of another because I'm causing myself stress because I'm setting myself up to like potentially spend another weekend in jail if I can't get it out of my system in time. But when it comes down to it, I always seem to make the choice to, to pick up again. Yeah. It sounds like on one hand, you it's stressing you out, but also it's how you cope with stress. So you're kind of stuck in this cyclical pattern. Right. I know things probably would be easier if I stopped. And, you know, I think about it sometimes. But I have, you know, like I said, I just, I have a hard time pulling the trigger. Mm -hmm. So when you think about stopping, what do you think about? Uh, not spending the weekend in jail for one. Um, yep. Yep. I probably wouldn't have to be, you know, here when I could be working. You know, that's what I really want to do with my recovery is I want to work. Uh, but I keep failing urines and ending up in jail for the weekend. So job and having to do extra things because I don't pass my urine. So, you know, job search has not been that easy. Sounds like you're really motivated to to work though. Can I am. That's, oh, yeah, ahead. that's, oh, that's what I really want to do. Like that's, you know, why did I get sober if I, I can't, you know, be productive member of society? What type of work would you want to do? Um, I've done mostly stuff in construction. Um, like my last job, I was laying cables for uh, an internet service provider. So I probably want to do that again, or you know, something like it, something physical. It sounds like you have a pretty extensive work history that you could kind of build off of too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I just, um, you know, I feel like I've got to stop doing this even though it's hard so that I can pursue that. Yeah. Can you tell me about the last time you used? It was over the weekend. Um, you know, I tend to do it on the weekend because I feel like it at least gives me a few days before I might have to go take a urine. Um, and I was kind of just spinning out with all of the thoughts about drug court and my participation. And, you know, my my partner isn't always sober. And so I decided to light up a joint. Well, but that's a really big deal that you were able, it's it's Wednesday, that was three days ago. So how were you able to sustain without using for those three days? Well, definitely as it gets more into the week, I know the likelihood that I could get caught and you know set myself back is higher because you know, they don't do urines on the weekend usually. So, um, you know, like I said, I want to work. I don't want to spend my weekends in jail. So I, I definitely, you know, try to keep it to when I think that situation won't happen. Well, and it sounds like you, you definitely have that external motivator of not wanting to go to jail, but there's, it, feels like there's a little bit of internal motivation happening too. Um, we were like, I, you know, there's stuff, stuff going on in the, the home, things like that. So what are some of the internal motivators for you? I want to support my family. I want to yeah. work. I want to be productive. I want to feel like I'm contributing. You know, that's, that's what I want to do. And that's what's, you know, not happening right now since I have to be in therapy and sometimes jail. Yeah. Well, 
for the sake of time, I'm going to wrap us, but it's today we, we talked a little bit about how you are stuck in a little bit of a cycle because you feel like on one hand, it's the best way you know to cope with stress and um, it helps you sleep. But on the other hand, you're adding more stress to yourself because you're ending up in jail and you're having to go to the store and spend money. And um, But you're a little bit torn about um, how to rectify that situation. Um, but you were also able to to sustain without using for, for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And, um, sounds like, you know, you definitely have that internal motivation and it's a strength that you're able to do that. Um, so I'm curious kind of moving forward, uh, how you might, uh, go from one day to two days. What would that look like for you? Uh, you know, I can try to distract myself or do something else instead of smoking when I start to feel stressed I like to play video games um because yeah no I you're right I can do it I just have a hard time when it comes down to it but it is it's getting in my way so maybe I can start with smoking less like only once a week or less during that day that I do decide to smoke um I don't know if I'm ready to do it quit altogether but I, I should probably cut back and and at least start there. Great. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to stop and we can uh, debrief a little bit. I know Mary put in the chat, do you have any other activities you can do for stress like gym, AA support groups, which I think is a great identifying alter alternate options for dealing with stress. Um, but next slide. Just curious, kind of based on that interaction, you know, what struck you about the interaction? Um, and did you notice, uh, what did you notice about the interaction? Did you notice any ores happening? <laughs> Hopefully. And to Mary's point in the chat, are there any other questions you felt like it would have been helpful to talk to ask Chuck or Charles about um, that would kind of further the conversation? Feel free to come off mute or drop it in the chat. I can certainly say having known this person and sitting in like kind of his seat. And I think that's part of why we do role plays, right? Not just to practice our skills, but to kind of experience what being the recipient of kind of this questioning is like. Um, I certainly noticed uh, a focus on my strengths, a focus on how I was able to be successful in the past and really feeling like Jordan was getting at um, why I wanted to do this, not like, oh, drug court is telling you need to stop, but really what made me want to change. So um, it yep. makes me reflect back certainly on working with this person. Kind of a cool experience. Um, Sydney put in the chat, Teresa, so you're comfortable opening, uh, comfortable and open speaking to the case manager. She didn't feel judged. Um, it was so great that Chuck was able to give up opioids and might not have uh, come up without open-ended questions, 100%. So for the sake of time, we're going to break up. Uh, we'll go move on to the next slide. It's a very open conversation, no judgment. Yep, and that's all about pace. It's like no judgment behind it, open-ended questions, 100%. And so um, we're going to spend some time in breakout groups um, and just... Uh, We'll break you up into groups. I think um, the what we want to do is there's a scenario. So you want to identify, um, we'll have one person that's going to be a person listening, uh, one person that's sharing a behavior they want to change, and one person observing. Um, and so uh, in the scenarios that we handed out, there's kind of behaviors that 
you might want to change. We think of losing weight, going to the gym, cutting down on smoking. Um, and it doesn't have to be a super personal behavior for you. You can make it up. Um, but we just wanted to give you an opportunity to role play asking these questions to somebody. So when we break up into groups, we want one person that's going to volunteer to be the person that wants to change the behavior. And then um, one person that's going to be asking those questions. Um, and so uh, then uh, we'll break up into those groups and we'll have facilitation and then we'll come back and debrief. It was um, non-related to homelessness, I got yeah, pretty much. So I noticed that that felt a little more strange to use it in that, in that um, setting. Yeah, I think sometimes it feels like you're out of out of practice, right? Oh, I don't normally do this, but I think um, you know it's the same skill set, and so uh, it definitely feels a little weird to do it around something different. Any other thoughts or reactions to kind of that process? Oh. Uh, me, um, for me, I think it's difficult for me to know what to say um, right at that moment, um, and I think it's good to like just have the client say what they need to say and just have a pause to be able to come back to saying something that's empathetic. Um, I do get um, from clients that I don't understand where they're coming from, like being more relatable has been probably um, the biggest barrier for me to connect with people. But the more that I come back and build that rapport, the more they're willing to trust me. So um that's been helpful as well yeah a hundred percent sometimes it can feel like pressure to say something and um or say the right thing but um just having that conversation is, is helpful so for the sake of time i'm gonna move on and uh go to the next slide and Teresa, i'm gonna give it back to you Okay, so we practiced our org skills and um, we're going to move on and kind of learn about some more skills to do a deeper dive in your conversation. So we're going to talk on talk about engaging, focusing, evoking and planning in our conversations with folks. You can go to the next slide. Engage. If you're doing outreach, you're already doing that. You're meeting people literally where they are. You're meeting their basic needs. You're getting to know them. Um, I think the one important point here is it's not just at the beginning, right? You have to continually nurture that relationship. Sometimes when discord comes up, it's a really good thing to fall back on. It's just like, okay, something is feeling difficult. Let's go back to engagement. Let me continue building my rapport with this person. Focusing, focusing on what the person in front of you needs, making sure that your focus is adjusted to what they need and not what your agenda is, um, but also, you know, having kind of like a plan for how um, the two of you are going to walk through this process together. Evoking is drawing out and asking questions that get to people's values and goals, and then exploring and planning. You know, we talked about this a little bit in stages of change. What seems like reasonable steps to that person to move forward through this process and to meet the goal that they want to meet? Next slide. Um, so we'll, not to be silly, but focus on focusing for a second. Um, and I think this happens a lot. I think, you know, a lot of folks, we have a lot of insight to when it feels a little off with our, uh, the person that we're working with. Maybe it feels a little strained. Maybe they're not as engaged. Maybe they withdrawn a little bit. And so it's a good time to step back and check in with yourself and say, um, am I really focusing on the person's goals? Am I hearing them? Am I listening to what they're saying to me? Or am I pushing kind of like my agenda? Do I have different aspirations for change for this person than they actually have for themselves? And how can I leave that behind? How can I leave that at the door when I when I come meet with them? And, you know, Jordan gave the example of a dance versus a wrestler. It shouldn't really feel like a wrestler. It should feel more like a dance, like you're doing this together. Um, and if it feels like you're moving in different directions, what is that about? Is that because I 
have been saying something that like maybe they're not ready to do yet? Am I am I kind of directing this too much instead of walking with the person? Um, and how can I refocus my lens like in the picture and try to get that perspective back so that I'm really being person centered and letting that person, you know, be the expert in their own experience um, and lead this process. Next slide. I just saw a comment that leaving the agenda at the door is hard. And that is absolutely true because we all show up with ourselves, right? When we come to work. Um, and that's a process, that's a change process for us as practitioners, right? And so hey, like we have those newsletters are ready for today yeah. now. I'm gonna mail them tomorrow morning because oh, I don't want people to get them. Thank you for putting yourself on mute. But um, what I was saying is, you know, that's a change process for us as practitioners, and it's a continual process. And guess what? We'll go through the stages of change on that too. But it is really important that we develop that insight to know what biases we might bring and to, to check them and to do that work, to be able to leave them behind. So we create that safe, non-gentle, non-judgmental, excuse me, space where someone feels like they can be open with you. Um, so let's discuss kind of the things you might hear in your conversations with people and, and kind of like laser in on how you highlight change talk. So, you know, talk about the stages of change. People kind of like may move around the wheel in terms of their process. So you might hear sustain talk. That might sound like, I don't feel ready to change. I don't think this is a problem. Um, this behavior, you know, it's, ser it's serving me. It helps me stay safe. It helps me stay relaxed. I don't really care to change at this point, maybe if you have someone that's mandated um, and they're really kind of maintaining what they're doing. They're they're feeling okay with that at this point. Um, discord might look like conflict. So disharmony, the two of you are not seeing eye to eye. It feels like the relationship is strained. They might not really be listening or engaging. You kind of notice that they feel checked out when they're talking to you um, and it might have some interpersonal conflict and you know we'll get to this in a moment but you know conflict has some value too and there's a way to work through that that can be really productive um and then there's change talk right and and that's what we want to listen for and really tune into i want to do this i'm you'll probably hear this one all the time i'm really sick of waking up sick i I'm only using to avoid being sick. This isn't enjoyable for me anymore. I don't like this. You know, we hear that all the all the time with our drug users. Um, my health is suffering. I want to do X, but this is getting in the way. So when you hear that talk, there's you know strategies to highlight that and elicit that and and reflect back to that person what they're saying. And that can be like a powerful thing, right? Because sometimes we just kind of like drop it in conversation. It's like, oh no, like. You're talking about your motivation to change. Next slide. And so when we hear that change talk, how do we continue the conversation? In addition to using your aura skills, um, it can help you if you ask questions kind of like getting at the why, like a person's why, like we all think about our why for coming to do this work every day. Well, what's their why? Um, what do they hope for in their future that they could see themselves getting back to if they stop doing this or if they get housed or whatever it is that you know they might have identified as wanting to work towards um i want to be back with my family that came up in our breakout group um i want to take care of my health so i can be around for my daughter like those types of things so like what's their why what's the future that they envision um and also like we talked about like what in their past is a reason that motivates them. Like what has worked that they could see themselves doing again. Always asking permission that goes along with a trauma informed approach. We don't want to push people to talk things, talk about things that they're not comfortable with. We we want to take that person's lead. Um, so saying, do you mind if we talk about X? And if, certainly if they say no, you know, back off of that. And, and trust that they know that they're not ready and that they may talk about it when they are, when you have established that safety. Um, asking specific examples when you hear change talk. Okay, you said you are sick of this. Can you tell me more about that? When was the last time that that happened? Um, and 
Like, what does that look like when that's happening? And looking backwards and forwards, we touched on this a little bit already, but how has it been better in the past? You can draw out some strengths there. You might find some things that have worked for them there that you can reflect back to them. Um, and how might changing this make your future look different? Next slide. This is what I mentioned, rolling with resistance. And this is like a hugely important skill. And I, I love this concept and I love this slide because I think sometimes we shy away from resistance and we have to stay in our role, right? Our role is to not judge. We're not here to be argumentative, but we're here to stay with that person through a conflict and kind of explore that and see how it could move them move them forward. Or maybe it's telling us something about the work that like we need to back off and that we're uh, pushing our agenda versus um, letting them take the lead. So resistance happens when we expect or push for change and the person is not ready. Maybe they're not ready to hear something. Maybe they kind of like moving back and forth and are ambivalent about making this change in the first place. Um, you know, we talked about the discord, the signs when we were on a previous slide. Um, but like I said, it's not our role to argue. It's not our role to judge. It's our role to kind of hear them out and then meet them where they're at and stick with them. And I think if you can work through a conflict with someone, um, that can be really healing. A lot of our folks have had experiences, particularly probably with providers, where they had conflict and that person stopped showing up or they had a conflict and they started treating them differently after that. Um, you can stay kind of like, you know, in your lane and, and in your commitment to partner with this person and you kind of just keep showing up, which I know on outreach, so many people, that's like a huge part of this. And Michelle, I think you touched on this in your comment. Um, you keep showing up, you keep developing that relationship and it can actually be a healing experience for someone to say like, oh, like I maybe didn't show my best behavior or maybe I was angry, but this person didn't abandon me when I was angry and they stuck with me and we're still working together. Um, so, you know, of course, if that's, that's, that's a person's, you know, discrepancy, like they want you to still continue to be there. But if you can work through that, conflict has its pace. And sometimes I think when you hash it out, you might have even more to work with in terms of what they're, what's driving and understanding their behavior. Next slide. Um, these are two tools that we kind of just wanted you to have. I know that on outreach, you might not be bringing paperwork out into the field. And I'm certain that you will probably not, um, you probably will not be assigning like homework like you might do in an individual therapy session. But I know there's some case managers here and um, really this is a tool. And if it's not a tool that you're gonna use itself, you can use it kind of like as a framework um, that helps someone think about the pros and cons of changing and the pros and cons of staying the same. Um, so it really kind of gets them to list out their reasons why, and then it's decisional balance, right? So like do the pros of making the change outweigh the cons of making the change? Do the pros of not making the change outweigh the cons of making the change? And so with that, like where do I land on how ready I feel to make this change or how motivated I feel to make this change? And it's just, it's a way to gauge people where you're at. Um, and yes, Jordy, you can like totally just use this to think of questions you might ask while you're in the field. Um, but it's, it's really kind of like getting at someone to really think that out and draw that out of them. Next slide. And similarly, um, you can use this if you're in an office, but in the field, you might ask a question like on a scale of one to 10, how willing are you to change? And if they say like, I'm a six, okay, um, what would allow you to get to an eight? Why aren't you at a two? So you're somewhere in the middle, you're, you're sort of thinking about making this change, you're sort of ready to make the change. What would make you, if you don't wanna use numbers, if that doesn't feel like your style or natural, what would make you more ready to change? Tell me about, a time you were at an eight. There's a lot of follow-up questions you can ask about this. And you can ask these questions for like, how willing are you? How 
confident do you feel like if we made a plan that you could follow through with that what would make you feel more confident can you think about situations where you felt less confident what was that like or you could you can you can use the number questions what if you're at a six what would get you to an eight why aren't you at a one why aren't you not confident at all you have some confident and kind of like draw on that strength and use that to have a conversation um and lastly readiness you can ask like all similar questions for readiness. So like, how willing are you? How confident are you? And how ready? And that can kind of inform your approach and the way that you move forward together. Yes, Jordan put it in the chat on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you to make this change? And like, yeah, have them elicit like, why is a six instead of seven? Like what could get them to a seven? Or why isn't it a two? So, you know, what's making you feel like you there's part of you that can do this? Go to the next slide. And this is just, I had to put this in here because I want this to be kind of like at the forefront of everyone's mind. You could have all of the skills in the world, but if you don't have that unconditional positive regard and that kind of like, um, you're communicating that you feel that the person has inherent value and worth, no matter they whether it is they decide to change or not, um, then none of the skills are gonna be effective because they're not gonna be able to feel safe to be open and honest. They're not gonna be able to feel safe to make change. We need to have that kind of environment to feel safe um, making change. So I think with that, we can move on to the next slide. And we're going to do a bit of an abbreviated breakout room instead of um, a 10 minute breakout room. We're going to do a five minute breakout room. Uh, you're going to have a case scenario. You're going to, one of the people in the group will hopefully volunteer to play Danielle. Um, and we can use this case scenario to practice some of the skills that we've been talking about. So I think in the interest of time, do we want to have people drop in the chat kind of like what this, we could go to the next slide, kind of the debrief for this, or do we want to have open discussion, Jordan? I think we can have like one or two people and everybody okay. also use both. Um... Sure. So if anyone wants to come off mute and talk about like what this was like and what their experience is like, or if you want to pop it in the chat, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I think working with Danielle is a lot of coping skills we would have to take with her. Uh, seems like she's kind of made her life into living on the streets. Like somebody who's incarcerated, that's their life. They only know incarceration. To me, it seems like that's all she knows. And maybe she's frustrated now, but uh, what kind of steps we can take with her to help her cope with being homeless and we can help her go on to readiness for housing. And Mary, you made a really good point in the breakout room about assessing like that readiness and not pushing some of the other issues that you might identify an issue as an issue, but she's not identifying. So really meeting um her where she's at Patricia mentioned that the fact that when you um sometimes when we're talking with clients we forget that we're giving them a lot of stuff to do and we have to keep keeping in mind that they're the ones that are going to get to pick what they want to work on and we can't um overload people with stuff. Yeah, especially if they're living outside and their survival needs are, you know, kind of paramount. And it's it's really hard to do much of anything else. So I think, yeah, you know, managing expectations and really letting them guide you. Go to the next slide.
I think so this is kind of what we originally had planned as a debrief, but it was really good to hear the feedback from the people that did the breakout groups. Um, and I think in the interest of time, we can go to the polling question. Yes, Maria, good point. Um, safety is super, super important when we're talking about people with trauma. Okay, so these, um, these questions are more about you and kind of what your needs are um, in terms of like technical assistance, learning more on the topic that we talked about today. So if you could just take some time to answer those, that would be great. And I'll just say while you're filling that out, if there are any questions, um or anything, feel free to elevate that, Teresa, and I will stay on for a little bit too. You know people are still completing the survey, but we just wanted to thank you for participating today. We really appreciate kind of the participation. I know I was in a breakout group where they didn't have access to microphones and put it in the chat. So I really appreciate everyone's kind of use of chat and coming off mute. Um, I know it was a smaller group, but it's often, um, it takes bravery sometimes to talk in front of a big group around some of this. So we really appreciate the participation. I wanna shout out Jasmine who was the, she was like the practitioner role twice. Um, and she did a great job. She's a pro now. <laughs> thank you, Jasmine. And thank you for the shout out. And this last uh, slide is that we do have another upcoming training on the topic of harm reduction. Um, September 20th from 9 to 11 a.m. And you can, sign up via the newsletter. Um, so we'll, it's going to be, you know, the basics and principles, um, working with folks that do outreach to talk about how they can incorporate harm reduction more into their work. Um, you know, we talked about biases today, but there's certainly a lot more of that we can dive into. Um, like, you know, I heard people when they said that that's tough. Um, and then some practical harm reduction strategies. So that's just a plug for that upcoming if anyone is interested. Perfect. So thank you all again. We'll stay on if there are final questions, but uh, I know we are at time. So we really appreciate the participation and you being here today.